Good evening, dear listeners. Today I'm going to tell you about the great angel Sanguinius. I'm a bit old for all these complicated names from the Warhammer 40k universe, so if I've got the pronunciation wrong somewhere, please let me know in the comments. I'll keep it in mind for my next videos. The tapestry of human civilization's history is woven from colourful strands of the past, present and future. Entangled threads of good and evil intertwine within it, contradicting and merging together. In the world of eternal war, where brother betrays brother and son rises against father, the path to siding with good can easily lead into the darkness of misconception. This perilous and uncertain road of doubt may justify even the vilest betrayer. Every moment one must remember the essence, uncertainty, in the destructiveness of evil motives, only ends in plummeting into the abyss. But where does that dividing line lie, on both sides of which black and white are situated? What in the boundless universe can be called exemplary good and evil? These fundamental questions about relative concepts will never find satisfactory answers capable of appeasing everyone. Yet once upon a time, above the merciless fire of war, people saw the embodiment of true good, the winged son of God, sincerely loving humanity and willingly sacrificing his life for it. The hero of today's tale is Sanguinius, the great angel, the emperor's only creation that turned out flawless. Having ravaged the Emperor's laboratory, the ruinous powers abducted a capsule containing the little Primarch of the Ninth Legion. Sensing how different the Angel was from his brothers, the Dark Gods immediately desired him. None of the Primarchs seemed as appealing to the Chaos Gods. The capsule with the winged infant was abandoned in the Baal system. The planet of the same name was a lifeless desert orb with two inhabited moons, Baal Prime and Baal Secundus. The latter became the homeland of the Great Angel. The Imperium classifies worlds like Baal Secundus as feral, and in the past it was a paradise planet with a rich ecosystem. Both moons had a good atmosphere, and people on them existed carefreely in harmony with nature. The ancient inhabitants of the Baal satellites were skilled craftsmen. Creating masterpieces of exceptional beauty, they even ventured to the main planet, which was always desert, to carve statues of rulers or gods from its mountains. But no civilization can thrive forever. It is genuinely unknown what catastrophe led to the demise of three human worlds simultaneously, but it can be assumed that during the Age of Strife the inhabitants of the Baal system attempted to destroy each other simultaneously using nuclear, chemical and viral weapons. Cities turned into plains of molten glass, lush forests and fertile fields into infected deserts, seas into poison swamps of toxic sludge. Billions of people met a horrible death and human civilization on Baal was on the brink of self-annihilation. Yet, on the outskirts of radioactive deserts, small groups of survivors remained. But in their desperation to cling to life amidst the ruins of their lost world, people themselves did not notice how they turned into scavengers and cannibals. For centuries, the survivors trapped in the poison system accumulated toxins in their bodies. This inevitably led to the majority of the population turning into mutants, and the wastelands were overrun by clumsy parodies of their noble ancestors who had destroyed the world. Small groups of people clinging to hope of retaining their humanity gathered into tribes attempting to create a new civilization amidst the ruins of the old. In response, Cannibal mutants also formed semblances of alliances for more efficient attacks on human settlements. This forced the untainted tribes to adopt a nomadic lifestyle, travelling across Baal Secundus in search of shelter and provisions. Yet even in such conditions, human groups continued to war with each other. Alliances were formed and dissolved, the weakest perished, and the strongest expanded their influence. People wandered the world on rusty machines, their pitiful existence a constant fierce struggle for life. Everything pointed to humanity's doom, with only mutants left in the wastelands devouring each other. The flourishing paradise on the second moon of Baal had turned into a hell, but through the heavens pierced a burning meteor of hope. Little Sanguinius was found by one of the migrating tribes, calling themselves the Pure Blood. These people carefully and harshly monitored the preservation of the correct genes of their group and cut off those born tainted by radiation. But the celestial capsule presented them with an unexpectedly complex question. 
whether to save the life of the foundling infant. Two dazzling white wings were growing from the baby's back, unmistakably marking him as a mutant. But otherwise, he was the most beautiful child the unfortunate Barlites had ever seen. Lengthy debates among the tribe members led to the only possible outcome. Unable to resist their own compassion, people spared the little angel's life. Soon he would prove that not only his body, but also his flawless soul, corresponded to this bright nickname. One can only speculate on the difficulties the young Primarch had to face on the unfriendly planet. Because of his gentle nature, he did everything possible to conceal his great deeds from public view. Therefore, the archives of the Imperium hold only those fragments that the Barlites themselves revealed. It is known that, like his brothers, Sanguinius developed much faster than ordinary children, and within three weeks of the capsule's landing, he looked like a three-year-old child. According to legend, at this age, he killed a huge fire scorpion with his bare hands. Fear was unknown to him from an early age, especially when it came to protecting his loved ones. Within a year, the Primarch reached maturity, and his snowy, childlike wings transformed into powerful, awe-inspiring wings. He mastered all the knowledge preserved on the planet and surpassed every warrior in combat skill. With his flawless appearance, the angel inspired the people around him, spreading an aura of grace and hope. It seemed that there was no more serene and clear face in the world. Until one day, mutants attacked the tribe that had taken in the Primarch. More than a hundred cannibals attempted to ambush and eat a small group of nomads. But Sanguinius did not allow it. He single-handedly saved his people, killing all attackers. But joy did not immediately appear on the faces of his loved ones. At first, there was only fear. Despite the wild conditions of their nightmare life, the people in the tribe were genuinely frightened by how they saw their angel in rage. Worrying for the lives of his family and friends, Sanguinius was deeply enraged. In his furious might, he was magnificent, yet instilled a chilling dread in hearts. A golden halo shone around his head, and his sorrowful face promised retribution for every guilty party in his wrath. After this battle, the Primarch decided to rid the world of the oppression of cannibal mutants and unite the scattered human tribes to create a unified civilization on Baal Secundus. Under Sanguinius's adept leadership and with the help of his unique combat prowess, people cleansed the world of mutants and gained another chance to build a civilization. The Primarch's tribe became dominant and rallied other groups around them. Watching the avenging and perfect angel hovering in the skies, the unfortunate Barlites could not help but call him a god. People thanked Sanguinius for the opportunity to live without fear in the emerging world again and hoped that the brightest one would elevate Baal to its lost paradise heights. The planet's inhabitants created a cult around Sanguinius. Then the Emperor appeared in the world. For the arrival of the Emperor of Mankind, a special day was chosen. Tens of thousands of Barlites gathered in the massive natural amphitheatre on Mount Seraph to witness the great angel in person. The radiant emperor stood among the crowd of admiring people and listened to Sanguinius's inspiring speech along with everyone else. The father saw how beautiful his lost son was, and he understood that the attentive crowd along with his words found something more than hope. Hardly noticing the approaching emperor, Sanguinius immediately recognised him, the angel felt that this meeting would happen. His gift of foresight would play a decisive role in the Primarch's life more than once. Overflowing with emotions, the great angel fell to his knees, and his radiant tears fell on the crimson sands of Baal. In response, the poisoned soil blossomed with beautiful flowers, as dazzling white as the wings of the brightest one. Knowing that the Father sought to destroy all existing religions, Sanguinius feared that the Bylites would be punished for their faith in the great angel. But the Emperor offered his son a hand and raised him from his knees. He pointed to the thousands of faces turned towards them and concluded that all these men and women had resolute and pure souls, and their thoughts were as noble and just as Sanguinius's. Reading absolute devotion and great love in the Primarch's eyes, the Emperor allowed Baal to exist without changing its nature. The Imperial Truth did not touch the world, and only those ships to which Sanguinius commanded were allowed to land on Baal Secundus. 
the tribe of the people of the pure blood continued to live as before and prayed to their winged god, while the Primarch himself left the planet to lead the blood angels at the Emperor's command. In his service to the Father, Sanguinius's heart remained as pure, humble and open. The Ninth Legion recruited new recruits from Baal and Terra, and the angel loved all his sons equally. His bright feelings were so strong that the death of each legionnaire echoed in Sanguinius's soul with excruciating pain. Sometimes he wondered if he was being a good enough father, and if his warriors were happy. It's hard to say which other Primarchs might have had such thoughts. Like the Baalites, the Blood Angels inherited their father's best qualities from him. They remembered that they fought for ordinary people, and that the well-being of humanity was the highest goal worth sacrificing themselves for. Even in critical situations, when it would have been more logical to save themselves instead of mortal ballast, the Blood Angels could not abandon helpless people to their demise. Sanguinius also thought about the welfare of the mortal members of his expedition. He respected all the people around him and didn't even have a chair on the ship's bridge. By his order, the Angel abolished this rule throughout the entire fleet, wanting to emphasize that the captain, not the Primarch, was the main figure on the ship. Officers who spoke with Sanguinius didn't feel that the brightest one was far above them, even though he significantly surpassed those around him in height. The Angel seemed to want to show his interlocutor that they were equals, although in reality it wasn't the case. The winged Primarch often praised subordinates for their work, even if it was entirely routine. Astartes and mortals loved and respected the great angel. His presence on the battlefield inspired allies and terrified enemies. All Primarchs were created by powerful demigods, but even they acknowledged that Sanguinius surpassed each of the Emperor's sons. After all, he is often called the greatest of the brothers. Lorgar Aurelian compared the angel to Horus, pointing out that both Primarchs harmoniously combined many facets of perfection. But Sanguinius eclipses his brother with his virtue, mercy, and understanding of ordinary people. Horus himself acknowledged the greatness of the Primarch of the Ninth Legion. He believed that the soul of the Emperor and his most humane qualities were reflected in his winged brother. In those times when the mind of Lupercal had not yet been poisoned, Horus spoke of Sanguinius's outstanding abilities, foresight, strength, and wisdom, leading the Imperium to triumph. But the great angel, due to his humility and modesty, never desired success for the sake of glory. His only concern was the well-being and happiness of others. This drive guided his hand with the sword. Nevertheless, as the Primarch himself confessed when raising his blade, he often felt sadness more than rage. However, despite the gracious aura and impeccable splendor, deep down Sanguinius always felt a tiny vulnerability within himself, starting with a simple desire to lick his lips at the sight of blood, which threatened to soon turn into an irreparable catastrophe. Confirming his fears, the Blood Angels legionnaires conducted rituals before battle based on blood manipulation, and rumors spread in other legions that the sons of the Brightest One drank the blood of defeated enemies. Many wonder why, having the gift of foresight, Sanguinius did not prevent impending disasters. The answer is simple. The future is ambiguous. The angel understood that he saw only one of the possible outcomes of events, and whether the vision would come true depended on the path chosen by the person influencing the events. The Primarch exerted all his strength to change what depended on him and with angelic humility accepted what he could not change. This obedience of the great angel played a significant role in his relationship with the Father. Absolute loyalty and unwavering faith in the Emperor's righteousness never left him. Despite siding with Magnus during the trial and insisting that psychers continue to fight and improve their powers after the final decision was made, the Ninth Legion immediately complied. The great angel understood perfectly well how important librarians were, but he agreed with the Emperor solely because of his faith in his father's wisdom. However, the Primarch did not isolate his psychers from other legionnaires like Rogel Dorn did. He only ordered them not to use their powers anymore. 
In addition, the Blood Angels librarians, by the Primarch's order, preserved meditation chambers where warriors could soothe their minds. In response, Sanguinius's sons sincerely renounced their abilities and did not use them even during battles with other psychers. Despite being most friendly with Horus, the Great Angel's sympathy and friendliness extended generously to all his brothers. He was the only one who responded to the request for reinforcement coming from the 88th expedition under Alpharius's leadership. The 20th Legion was engaged in eradicating orcs, who, after Ulanor, had hidden in their last refuge. Support was needed for the Alpha Legion to accomplish the task. But the warrior, busy with his own battles, did not want to part with his combat units. Learning of this, Sanguinius personally went to the Alpha Quadrant, taking ships from each of his active expeditions. The 20th returned only at the very end of the operation, finally clearing the area by exterminating the last surviving orcs. The expedition was successful. However, Sanguinius's love for his brothers emanated from his soul not only in the form of assistance in battles, but also in the form of simple words of support. After the triumph at Ulanor, Horus, who received the title of War Master, was perplexed and could not fully enjoy his success. Being named first among equals, he assumed that many brothers would consider him unworthy and would not fully obey his orders, and only Sanguinius, the one who many truly acknowledged as worthy of the title of War Master, came to Horus, hoping to support his brother. His bright soul was open, and in his pure gaze there was only sincere joy and pride. Seeing how deeply Lupercal was immersed in anxious thoughts, Sanguinius joked that such complex reflections were the prerogative of Angron, not Horus. Wanting to reassure his brother burdened by the weight of his new responsibility, the angel said that many Primarchs sincerely rejoiced for the chief defender of the Imperium. There was not even a hint of envy in his words, and Horus saw that. They were close friends who had fought shoulder to shoulder in many battles and had unwavering trust in each other. Through the joint efforts of the 16th and 9th legions, an entire world was cleansed of the dangerous Nephilim Xenos. Such warm relations and trust became the reason why he shared the burden of the curse that befell his sons with Horus. Sanguinius blamed himself for the sufferings of his legion and was convinced that the broken particles of his gene seed caused Astartes to feel the thirst for blood. To this day, it's difficult to say exactly what this phenomenon entails. There is evidence suggesting that a space marine succumbing to the thirst turns into a frenzied vampire, obsessed only with bloody desires and losing sanity akin to the unfortunate victims of the curse of the Wolfen. But at the same time, there's an opinion that a space marine who quenches the thirst for blood can regain himself and return to the ranks of his brothers, whereas the curse of the Wolfen is irreversible. The warrior promised to keep his brother's secret until he himself wished to reveal it to the world, or until the problem was resolved. As Horus began to tread the path of descent, he started to experience doubts that the winged Primarch would never share. Lupercal shared with his brother the concerns about the future of the legions after the final victory. Would there be a place for warriors in the new world? Sanguinius could not understand his brother's worries. The angel said that the ultimate goal of the eternal war is to bring peace and enlightenment to humanity, while Horus considered it as the Emperor's desire to rule the entire galaxy. Their strong friendship became one of the reasons that led Sanguinius to obey Horus's order to go to the Cygnus system. Another reason was that the Archbetrayer promised the angel a hidden cure for the curse within the system. Can a mortal representative of humanity, living in a safe world under the protection of the Emperor, clearly imagine and comprehend how terrifying chaos is? Even if this person strains their imagination to the utmost, they will never fully feel the depth of the nightmare into which their soul will plunge under the influence of the Dark Gods. Contemplating such a human hell awaited the great angel in the Cygnus system. At that time, he did not know that each of these deaths occurred in the name of his downfall. It was the price of treacherous Horus for years of impeccable service. The order to go to the trap on Cygnus was conveyed to the angel by the word bearers, insisting that the sons of Lorgar accompany the blood angels on the expedition. Thanks to their presence, the warp transition proceeded without incidents and usual casualties. 
Chaos was interested in the Legion reaching their destination as soon as possible. Besides the word bearers, the Legion of Sanguinius was accompanied by the Space Wolves, who were attached to the expedition by a direct order from Malkador the Sigilite. The wisest servant of the Emperor of Mankind wanted to ascertain whether the Ninth Legion remained loyal to the Imperium, but the Blood Angels themselves decided that the Wolves were sent to ensure compliance with the Edicts of Nikea. By that time Prospero had already been burned, and the suspicions cast on the winged Primarch went beyond just the use of psychers. Nevertheless, the Sons of Lehman Rust decided to keep silent about Magnus's betrayal. The warriors of the Sixth Legion knew that they would perish if Sanguinius proved to be no less treacherous than Magnus the Red, for defeating the Primarch for the Wolves was as impossible as renouncing their own nature as executioners. Upon arriving in the Cygnus system, all expedition ships lost contact with the Imperium. Vox channels between fleet sections began to work intermittently and with interference. The nearest planets of the system remained silent, and around its perimeter palpable darkness grew, extinguishing the stars. The fleet of the Great Angel began to drown in the nightmare of Horus's vile hatred. The first planet of the system greeted them with a grandiose and abominable spectacle. The landscape reshaped itself, cutting through colossal canyons of boiling lava, erasing continents and raising new mountains. When the dust settled, the horrified onlookers saw an eight-pointed star of chaos stretching across the entire visible surface of the world, and then the planet emitted a scream, causing most of the mortal crew to commit suicide. Each new world of the Cygnus system met the Blood Angels expedition with increasingly horrific creations of chaos. The fleet suffered losses among the Astartes and mortals alike. Entire ships disappeared and were consumed by infernal planets. The atmosphere became so heated that after the demise of another vessel, the enraged Sanguinius was compelled to issue a fatal decree, contradicting his merciful nature, Exterminatus. Despite the fact that the doomed world was hopelessly corrupted and obviously had no chance of recovery, the subordinates surrounding the angel saw how difficult it was for them to make such a bitter decision. But the main torture born of the destructive forces, occurred in the mind of the great angel. In agonizing dreams, Sanguinius witnessed his descent into darkness. Wingless and fallen in these visions, the angel felt an incredible rage from realizing his own helplessness and futility. And from the depths of his soul, wrapping around the spirals of genetic code, rose an unimaginable fury, promising tragedy. But even while immersed in this madness, Sanguinius was confident in his purity and loyalty, stubbornly repeating to himself, I cannot fall. Once the winged Primarch was asked, Did the Emperor create you an angel? Did he create a devil in opposition to you? In response to this, Sanguinius jokingly asked, Is the Asker familiar with his brother Magnus? It was typical of the father of the Blood Angels to temper heavy conversations with humor, but in every joke there is always a grain of truth. The defiant Magnus constantly ignored paternal orders in pursuit of his own goals. Sanguinius, on the other hand, obediently adhered to every word of the Emperor, sincerely believing that there was simply no option to disobey. The behavior of each of the Primarchs corresponds to an ancient Terran saying, calling a mortal man fortunate to have freedom of choice, as demons only know rebellion and angels only obedience. The great angel simply could not betray. But Chaos, unlike Horus, did not suspect this. Concluding a pact with the ruinous powers, the Archbetrayer insisted that Sanguinius perish in the Cygnus system. And the inability of the Angel to betray was stated by Horus as the main reason for his murder. However, cunning demons discerned another, more significant reason in his soul. Lupercal feared competition. Remembering numerous commendations of Sanguinius as the best warrior for the galaxy, as well as the angel's virtues surpassing his own, Horus feared being overshadowed by the true hero. He felt how strongly Chaos desired the brightest one, and understood that with his rage and power, the corrupted angel would become incomparably more powerful than Lupercal. The demons saw these concerns and mocked the Archbetrayer, not ceasing their attempts to poison Sanguinius' soul. Horus, on the other hand, hoped that the death of the angel would plunge the Ninth Legion into the abyss, turning the warriors into soulless berserkers. 
His plan was aided by Erebus of the Word-Bearers. Thoughts of the fall of the winged Primarch and the corruption of the noble Blood Angels aroused gleeful anticipation of victory among the traitors. However, despite the surrounding nightmare, Sanguinius refused to believe in Horus's treachery. Gathering his commanders for a council, the angel asked them for their versions of what was happening, but in anger he attacked the first who expressed suspicion of Lupercal's treachery. With pain in his heart, the great angel vehemently rejected the righteousness of those blaming his brother. A betrayed soul should not interfere with waging war in the system. Therefore, the Primarch declared the origins of the horror that befell Cygnus as irrelevant, and called on everyone to first destroy the enemy, and then seek out the guilty. The angel wanted to personally speak with Horus and ask him about his betrayal, looking his own brother in the eye. Although Sanguinius had left Horus's fall under question for a long time and actively avoided directly pointing out the treachery of the 16th Legion, he quickly accepted the fact of another brother's betrayal, Lorgar, which once again underscores the special friendship of the angel with Horus and the biased attitude towards the fanatical Aurelian. Despite the chaos surrounding them, the forces of the Blood Angels continued to act cautiously and maintain order. This displeased the demonic forces, eager to enslave or destroy the Legion as quickly as possible. To provoke Sanguinius into a rash action, the Keeper of Secrets of Slanesh, Kiris, personally appeared in the Primarch's quarters. Before the Angel's eyes, several servitors were torn apart, and from the bloody human fragments emerged an ugly demonic avatar. The warp spawn expressed its delight at finally beholding the beautiful Sanguinius in its domain. The great angel responded to such a presentation unoriginally. He drew his sword and offered surrender in exchange for a simple and swift death. Even demons, thanks to Sanguinius's mercy, could be granted death without torment. However, Kyris was not interested in avoiding pain. The Avatar was defeated, but it tainted the mortal crew of the flagship forcing them to kill each other and destroy the command console. Sanguinius was deeply saddened by the death of those loyal to him. Discovering the crew executed, the angel knelt, weighed down by the heaviness of his grief. Watching space marines were amazed at the Primarch's ability to mourn for those infinitely below him. The Astartes knew that their father was merciful and kind, but they did not suspect that the deaths of subordinates could cause him such suffering. Warriors thought the angel was above such emotions, but grief did not deprive Sanguinius of his authority as a war leader. Left without a captain, the uncontrollable Red Tear risked destruction, plummeting to the surface of Cygnus Prime. Astartes on the bridge expected the worst, but the great angel was confident in the reliability of his flagship. The Primarch ordered everyone to take cover in the sturdy depths of the internal compartments, and he himself approached the helm panel and placed his angelic palm on it. He greeted the spirit of the ship and asked it to deliver the Legion to the heart of the enemy fortifications. The ship complied with Sanguinius's request. Despite the crumbling hull and failing systems, the battered but unbeaten Red Tear challenged the enemy and fulfilled the Angel's request. Not a single Legionnaire on board could maintain balance during the dangerous landing, and at the moment the drop hatches opened, absolutely all warriors lay on the deck. All except Sanguinius. The angel could not fall. At the Primarch's command, the damaged war barge was turned into a fortress by the efforts of the survivors. The Blood Angel's legion was finally about to face the enemy face to face. Meanwhile, Sanguinius intended to kill Kiris the Demon of Slaanesh, who recently called herself the Mistress of the Cygnus System. Thus, the Brightest One planned to free the worlds from the destructive influence of the warp. Unfortunately, the Great Angel did not take into account that demons are deceitful, and that Kiris was not the sole ruler of the system. The Keeper of Secrets arrived on Cygnus by order of her god, and with the aim to seduce or destroy Sanguinius. However, in the company of Slanesh's servant, there was the greater demon of corn, Kabanda, performing the same tasks, but for his own master. Apparently, the Blood God thought that the Blood Angel's Legion would be the perfect executor of his desires. During the battle, Sanguinius mistook Kabanda for a minion of Kyris, unwilling to delve into the demonic hierarchy. 
This angered the bloodthirsty demon, but he continued to follow his vile plan. In an attempt to make the angel feel true rage, Cabanda revealed the pact with Horus, exposing the arch-betrayer's true desires. But Sanguinius did not believe the demon's words. He replied that he considered Horus a brother and a friend who could not betray him. However, the mockery angered the great angel, and he attacked Korn's servant with unexpected ferocity. The roar of their battle overshadowed the noise surrounding the fight. Sanguinius's might surprise the demon, who did not expect such power from a short-lived being. But at the moment, it seemed that the great angel had struck Cabanda, piercing his chest with a sword. The infernal whip in the demon's hand encircled Sanguinius and hurled him down, breaking the Primarch's legs. The angel was shaken by his fall, but still did not lose his fighting spirit and called the demon to launch another attack, intending to fatally wound Korn's servant this time. Cabanda did not want to make such a mistake. Instead, the demon said he wanted to inflict the worst pain on the brightest one, to do what the angel feared most in the world. The servant of Korn loudly cursed the Primarch and promised to torment the Ninth Legion until it ceased to exist. And after these words, he turned to the Blood Angels and, within the span of a single heartbeat, destroyed five hundred sons of Sanguinius. From the psychic pain and the loss of many sons, the angel lost consciousness and it was a deeper absence than mere forgetfulness. In response to this, each legionnaire felt horror, and someone thought, the angel has fallen, and my brothers have died. The angel has fallen, and so have I. In addition to this, the imprint of Sanguinius's psychic suffering manifested in the warriors, causing a destructive phenomenon for the first time, later named the Black Rage. It's impossible to say exactly what happened to the great angel and where his soul went at that moment, but his sons couldn't bring him back to his senses. A catastrophe occurred. The Legion was in a communication-impenetrable, corrupted system, with no help to be expected, and their beacon and defender had fallen. Unparalleled circumstances and love for their Primarch compelled the Blood Angels to do the unthinkable to disobey the Emperor's orders and violate the Edicts of Nikia. Gathering together to journey into the unknown behind their father's soul, the Librarians understood that someday they would have to answer for disobeying the Emperor, and they were prepared to die for it. Later. But for now, they needed to bring back the Primarch. All except one, the psychers involved in the process of Sanguinius's return, were killed by a cultist who infiltrated the ship. But their sacrifice was not in vain. The Primarch returned from the Void even more wrathful and powerful than before. But what the last surviving Librarian witnessed during his mission to rescue the Great Angel is capable of forever changing the attitude towards the results of the Horus Heresy. The Legionnaire was shown the truth, which the Primarch had long known. One could speculate endlessly about what would have happened to the Imperium if Sanguinius had sided with Chaos. However, the angel himself knew the answer to that question perfectly well. He was shown futures, changing depending on the preferred path, and he was free to choose the path of his destiny. In one vision, the great angel pierced Horus's heart with a spear and emerged victorious. In another, the Ninth Legion bore symbols of the Chaos Gods on their armour and faces. In the third, the brightest one died a torturous death at the hands of the arch-betrayer, leaving the Emperor a chance for salvation. In the fourth, Sanguinius, surrounded by his valiant brothers, sat on the Golden Throne as befitting the Emperor. Each of these and many other future possibilities could become reality, should Sanguinius desire it. But he rejected all others, and chose the one where Horus breaks his bones and brutally kills him. Will mortals ever understand his motives? Long before the trap on Cygnus, the great angel knew he would die. He saw his own funeral and his proud sons carrying his body to the beautiful and majestic sepulchre on Baal. Like a humble angel, he rejected the future where the mighty Sanguinius eclipses the Emperor, but accepted the one where he dies to save the Imperium. The Primarch sincerely wished happiness for humanity and wanted his sons to be as humble as he was. Even when brought back to life at the expense of his librarians, Sanguinius mentioned that the reckoning for the use of forbidden power would come some day. Like a fiery comet of vengeance, the angel headed for the demon's lair, which they had erected using previously abducted human bones. He saw the warp-infested planet swarming with abominations, felt the deaths of his sons, 
and the pain of billions of lost lives, yet still did not believe that his closest friend and brother was capable of betrayal. Scarcely entering the accursed abode, Sanguinius impaled the demon Curious to the wall with his sword and engaged Cabanda for the second time. The power of the enraged angel was so great that the servant of Corn could only weakly parry the strikes and distract the Primarch with taunts about Horus's treachery. But Sanguinius did not heed the provocations. He tore the wings off the bloodthirster, mockingly saying that only angels were allowed to fly. And before delivering the final blow, he ordered the demon to tell everyone in the underworld who had crushed him. However, the Keeper of Secrets Curious, though leaking his black blood, still breathed. He pointed to the capsule placed in the center of the corrupt temple, where Erebus had imprisoned the soul of one of the Astartes, a blood angel. It was with the help of this infernal mechanism that the traitors planned to plunge the Ninth Legion into hell. Bound by blood with Sanguinius and his sons, the abducted legionnaire plunged into unbearable flames of suffering and rage was supposed to hasten the manifestation of the genetic curse. Kiris told the Primarch that the Red Thirst was just the beginning of the calamities laid upon the legion, and Sanguinius believed him, recalling the recent episode of the Black Rage. The demon offered the great angel a choice to watch the inevitable madness and suffering of his sons, or to sacrifice himself and step into the capsule, merging with the abducted, cursed space marine, taking into his soul the rage and pain destined for the Legion. The intricate and unfathomable deceptions of Horus, unexpectedly and accidentally, led to something vaguely resembling the truth. As promised by the arch-betrayer, on Cygnus, Sanguinius saw the path to healing for his sons, the pure soul of the angel was ready to burn for the well-being of his legion, and despite the protests of his commanders, Sanguinius almost followed the Keeper of Secrets' instructions. Only the self-sacrifice of one of the warriors who managed to take the place intended for the Primarch saved the blood angels from falling, for none of the curses could heal the angelic sacrifice, and Sanguinius himself would not have died but would have turned into a willing vessel for the ruinous powers, as did the warrior who took up this burden for his father. Subsequently, the demon host legionnaire was delivered to Horus by Erebus as a gift for the failure on Cygnus. Tainted by the warp, the son of Sanguinius swore allegiance to the arch-betrayer, declaring himself completely under his power. From this it can be inferred that if the warrior had not sacrificed himself, the great angel could have become a bloodthirsty puppet of Horus, and the shocked and betrayed legion would have followed him. By the twist of fate this did not happen, and the blood angels, destroying the remnants of the demons, left Cygnus. At the warp transit points on Sanguinius's orders, beacons were installed, the task of which was to inform random travellers of the prohibition to set foot on the planet's surface. Once a thriving civilization disappeared, the system was doomed to eternal decay in darkness. The Space Wolves, attached by the Sigilite to the expedition, did not return from Cygnus. Possessed by the Red Thirst, the Blood Angels killed their comrades during the battle and drank their blood. The Legion commanders, upon learning of this, wisely concealed the shameful episode from Sanguinius. Knowing the noble and righteous character of their Primarch, they assumed that their father would surely go to Lehman Rust to confess the sins committed by his sons, and the wolf, in his fury, might start a battle that would lead to another schism in the already weakened Imperium. Moreover, the warriors who somehow committed the murder of the wolves regained their sanity. Presumably, by drinking blood, the Space Marines quenched their thirst until the next critical moment. Amit the captain of the Fifth Company, primogenitor of the Flesh Terrors, was directly involved in the shameful murder of the Space Wolves, but self-control returned to him after Sanguinius finally crushed the demons on Cygnus Prime. Leaving the poisoned system, the Blood Angels intended to go to Terra, but could not. During the Battle of Kalth, the word-bearers unleashed monstrous warp storms of immeasurable power, and the navigators of the Ninth Legion did not understand how to navigate in the Immaterium. The Psychers felt that the light of the Astronomicon had split, 
Sanguinius ordered them to follow the brightest beacon, assuming it was the Astronomicon of the Emperor, and leave the warp as soon as possible. But upon returning to real space, the Blood Angels found themselves hundreds of light years away from the designated point in the Ultramar subsector of Rabuta Gilliman. The Primarch of the 13th Legion personally arrived to welcome his brother to the realm of the 500 worlds. Since the Imperium was divided by warp storms into two parts that could not communicate with each other, Gilliman announced the foundation of Imperium Secundus, desiring to continue his father's work and reunite the Riven Galaxy. Sanguinius was proclaimed the heir of the Emperor and the Regent of Imperium Secundus, and the arriving Lion L. Johnson, the Lord Protector and Lord Commander of the Armed Forces, which in status was equivalent to the title of War Master. Unfortunately, the new Empire did not find a prosperous existence, and the Night Lord's Primarch Conrad Kurz, imprisoned on the flagship of the Dark Angels, escaped to Macreg with the aim of plunging the capital of Ultramar into the abyss of nightmare and chaos. Over the next two years, Conrad Kurz terrorized the city, while Lyon and Raboot Gilliman argued about ways to capture him. L. Johnson was ready to subject Macrag to exterminatus, along with all its inhabitants, just to destroy the Dark King. Sanguinius and Gilliman could not agree to human sacrifices for such a goal. In the end, Conrad Kurz was captured and brought to trial, where he not only refused to admit his crimes, but also sowed discord between the brothers by revealing that Lyon had indeed used previously forbidden mass bombings of civilian areas. The outcome of the trial was a death sentence for Conrad Kurz and the exile of Lionel Johnson from Imperium Secundus. However, neither the first nor the second was destined to happen. Already on board his ship, Lion unexpectedly decided to return and dissuade Sanguinius from executing the Dark King. He explained his action by saying that Kurz, gifted with the power of foresight, had said that his death would come at the hands of an assassin, not an angel. Comparing his brother's abilities with his own, the winged Primarch agreed and handed the condemned over to Lionel Johnson's authority. In the end of the heresy, unlike other loyal legions, the Blood Angels crossed the raging warp without difficulty and reached terror to aid in its defence. Some may see this as yet another fatalistic signpost to the outcome of Horace's rebellion, but perhaps the easy passage was simply due to luck. By the time the traitor forces arrived, only three legions defended the throne world, the Imperial Fists, White Scars, and the Blood Angels. Despite their courage and valour, the forces of the traitors, imbued with chaos, vastly outnumbered the defenders of humanity. Alongside the soldiers of the Imperial Army and the Legio Custodes, the Blood Angels stood at the very last line of defence, at the walls of the Imperial Palace. Radiant Sanguinius crushed demons high in the sky, whose terrifying sight alone could drive the greatest warriors insane. The winged Primarch single-handedly defended the high palace towers from the invasion of the demonic hordes of chaos. Many sources recounting these events praise the boundless valour and might of the great angel and his legion. Although hundreds of brave sons of Sanguinius perished, standing to the death at the palace gates, they halted the waves of chaotic abominations and prevented the desecration of the Emperor's abode. There are accounts telling of a bright glow appearing around the Ninth Legion's drop pods every time their father pierced another demon with his blade in the sky. During this battle, Sanguinius encountered his old enemy once again. The demon Cabanda, thirsting for blood, stood against the angel at the inner gates of the Imperial Palace. Taking advantage of the weariness of the Primarch exhausted by prolonged battle, Cabanda knocked Sanguinius down, casting him below. But the great angel summoned the last reserves of his strength, seized the demon, and broke its spine, shattering the creature's backbone over his knee. Then he threw the defeated monster into the crowd of its minions and locked the gates, preventing the fall of the palace. However, at that moment, it was only a temporary measure as the enemy's forces far exceeded those of the loyal legions. But the arch-betrayer, sensing the imminent arrival of reinforcements for the defenders, decided to hasten the meeting with the Emperor. Blinded by his own anger, Horus anticipated the pleasure with which he would bring the Emperor of Mankind to his knees and destroy his soul. 
The imminent arrival of the Ultramarines, Dark Angels and Space Wolves could stop the traitors and even drive them from terror. Therefore, Lupercal decided to weaken the psychic defences of his flagship and allow the father to come to the abode of his fallen son himself. Sensing this, the Emperor instantly teleported onto the hellish ship, and Sanguinius, Rogel Dawn, squads of Astartes from both legions, and the Legio Custodes followed the master of mankind. The Great Angel had long foreseen this event and had no doubt about its outcome. The pure soul of the Primarch had never been wrong in its predictions, and in the past he often helped his sons win battles by changing the plan with unexpected and original solutions. Ascending aboard the vengeful spirit, the Angel knew that he was not destined to leave the accursed ship alive. He went to his death as before infinitely loyal son of the Emperor and selfless defender of humanity. Betrayal by the forces of chaos divided the Primarchs and the Father, and Sanguinius was the first to confront the traitor Horus. Having increased his power with the forces of the Dark Gods, the Arch-Betrayer offered the Angel to join his side. Of course, Lupercal did not expect agreement. He simply wanted to inflict more pain on his brother, demonstrating the depth of his fall. The Brightest One rejected this offer. Sanguinius was exhausted from prolonged battles with Warp Spawn and the battle with the greater demon of Korn, Kabanda. But he still bravely entered the fray with his former friend, every cell of whom was saturated with the power of the four gods of the Immaterium. Even at the peak of his strength, the Angel could not have defeated the unified forces of Chaos acting through the body of the Arch-Betrayer. He knew this perfectly well and yet obediently marched towards his fate. The Great Angel managed to pierce Horus's armour with his sword, and for this deed the Ninth Legion calls their father the greatest of the Primarchs, as this blow is recognised as decisive in the battle between the Emperor and the Arch-Betrayer. Enraged, Horus crushed Sanguinius, exerting all efforts to make the death of his closest brother the most painful and terrible of those that only the boundless evil obedient to him could commit. Echoes of this psychic nightmare reverberated through space and time, adding new, gruesome facets to the curse of the Blood Angels Legion. Can you imagine how strong was the physical and spiritual pain inflicted by Horus on Sanguinius if even the ghostly imprint of it, millennia later, is capable of driving an Astartes warrior, who in a fit of the black rage imagines himself as his father fighting against the Arch-Betrayer? The heresy ended, but the greatest suffering for the Ninth Legion was only beginning. The body of the fallen Sanguinius, as he had predicted, was sent to Baal and buried in a lavish tomb beneath the Chapel of the Blood Angels. The entrance to the sepulchre is guarded by a winged statue created in the likeness of the Primarch. Ten millennia later, in reward for his sacrifice, Sanguinius remains one of the most revered Primarchs. Chapels in his honour are located on many worlds of the Imperium, alongside the temples of the God Emperor. In addition, there exists the religious festival of Sanguinala, during which believers tie a red ribbon around their arm as a sign of respect for the Primarch's heroic deed. Studying the life path of the Great Angel and marvelling at his actions, mortals will never be able to comprehend the motives born in such a wise mind. Like the Emperor possessing the gift of foresight, Sanguinius chose for himself a path of boundless suffering. It is impossible to speculate how the Imperium would have turned out if the Angel had chosen any other end, excluding voluntary death. But it is absolutely certain that self-sacrifice in the name of others' lives is the greatest manifestation of love for humanity. By willingly embarking on a terrible death, Sanguinius wanted not only to save the Imperium, but also to teach people by his example to save each other.